please. This week's episode of the Pole Line, I've got someone who uh, was in the heyday for me for bikes in my childhood in the Series 500 sort of years, but we've got uh, Leroy Redmond from Western Australia. So how are you going tonight, Lee? Thanks, mate. Yeah, I'm really good, mate. Um, weather's hit good here this weekend, so uh, yeah, life's okay. Before we talk about anything else, promote what you're doing Anything you want to promote, now's the time. Uh, mate, not much to promote. Um, yeah, obviously I'm a, uh, I'm a solo rider from years but gone by uh, in the 90s and uh, did my time at Claremont and um, obviously do a bit in England and, and overseas and uh, I'm a midget racer now and do a bit of sprint car racing as well. And um, Yeah, life's okay. Uh, I've got a, a hire company in Perth called Energy Hire um, and we, just, we uh, do the transport and um, earth moving side of things. You touched on a track, Claremont. Now, I was talking to DP, for those who don't know, Dave Parker. He's really helped me get all this together, and this will go down the line of people like Todd Wilshire, John O, all the people in that sort of era. But you said Claremont. Now, Dave said he used to get you to come over and teach the boys how to ride uh, drivey tracks. So how important was Claremont to you in your bike career? Oh, mate, um, to be honest, it, w- it was a massive part of what I did. Um, the first time I rode uh, Speedway bikes, um, it, it actually just ha- happened by accident, if I'm being quite honest. Uh, I was a motocross rider and I was a, I was a half-decent A-grade rider over here and riding for Kawasaki and uh, – Right at the end of uh, my motocross career, I was 19 when I actually started riding speedway, so I was a bit of a late a late intro, I suppose. Um, I had a guy come out of the crowd. Um, I rode stock bikes at Claremont, and um, I won a couple of meetings, and um, I just had a guy, Colin Thompson, come out of the crowd and ask me to ride a speedway bike. So uh, I said yes, because I'd, I'd been a fan all my life. And my, my dad, uh, Wayne Redman, was a, uh, a commentator at Claremont, along with uh, Con Migro, so... Um, Claremont meant a, a lot to me, so, and it was the place to race in Perth. So, if you wanted to get anywhere in, uh, in speedway bike racing, you, you needed to be good at Claremont. And um, I was pretty fortunate, mate. I uh, I rode, uh, I started at the back end of 1991 and had a few rides, and I qualified the first night because back in those days, you had to go through, there'd probably be 20 riders that actually had to qualify to get into the program. Like there was that many bikes, it was ridiculous. And um, I was lucky I qualified the first night I rode. I always say that that sounds good, but I, I ran a pretty distant sixth place in four th- in four races <laughs> but i qualified the first night and con said that was uh that was a pretty cool thing to do because not many guys did that so being a motocrosser it was pretty wet that night and i remember that 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 probably helped me a bit i was i was fairly decent in the motocross in the wet claremont was I, I am so privileged to have said that i i rode that era a bad bad night at claremont was probably eight ten thousand so you know we, we see how speedway is these days and don't get me wrong the, the motorplex gets decent crowds these days but um in a bike era um and sprint cars were starting to become pretty prominent obviously towards the, the 90s and, and and well into obviously 2000 when it finished but um bikes were still very prominent i rode against some really good guys like steve johnson and Glenn Doyle and Greg Bartlett and, you know, all those guys had good, good English careers, whereas um, I had a pretty short English career. I only, I only did a few years. So um, uh, in saying that, you know, I, I loved it. Um, you had a, a solo bike team from 2006 to 2008. Can you run us through that sort of era? Yeah, after I uh, stopped riding, I, I I was really really uh, good friends with David Tapp, and I still am to this day. And I'm, I'm very privileged that uh, I have guys like that in my life, and I can still call them really good friends. 
uh, him and Rod Calhoun and Mick Poole and, and the likes. Uh, Tappy started the Series 500 and um, he got he dipped his toe in the water about running the Australian title with um, guys like Dave Parker and they're all very good friends of mine. So I wanted to do something different. No one had ever really rolled up with a big transporter and, and had, had a team. As you know, like even Bike Speedway and, and Car Speedway, it's, you're still a team. No, no matter what the individual's doing, there's still a bunch of people around you that make it happen. I went and bought a truck out of Sydney and drove it home back to WA and got a heap of sponsors on board. And I funded a lot of it myself too, but um, I had a transport company that was going okay at the time. And uh, the first year we got um, over one of my teammates actually from Sheffield, Simon Stead who just had that outstanding style and a uh, very exciting rider. He was three-time under 21 British champion at the time. And so we got him over and uh, uh, one of my really good mates, uh, Steve Johnson, who rode uh, for, for Tap in the series for years and years, uh, he came on board as well. And, and we went through and we did the title. And the year that Jason Crump and... Um, uh, Lee Adams wrote it, I think it was like 2007 for memory. Um, John O actually finished third, and that was that was really good for us, and I think Simon finished fourth or fifth. We decided that we are going to do one more year with it because we'd just gone to start doing um, motocross as well, uh, Dave, and uh, we'd had support from Honda and stuff, so we thought that, that by doing the bike series, that was a the, the Speedway series, that would be another good promo for the upcoming MX Nationals. So um, I watched a young kid in the last round at uh, at Mount Gambier. Uh, uh, his name was Chris Holder. And I'd never seen like, the kid. He battled his way through the series. He, his, uh, his father, Mick, and um, his, you know, his, his ground crew, you could see they were struggling a little bit financially and, um, but I could see all the talent in the world, and just to, and to this day, I'm I'm, I'm proud to say I'm uh, you know still lifelong friends with those people. But um, I went up to when they did the presentation at Mount Gambier when um, when Crumpy won it and Lee was second and John I was third. We were pretty chuffed. But I just seen this kid; he'd done so well to get to the main, and I thought we need we need to get him on board for next year and. I walked up to him on the infield as he was pushing his bike back across and I said, hey, Chris, I, I'd really like you to come ride for us next year. And i ne- I never forget, he was so excited. And uh, he said, really? And I was like, yeah, mate, you've, you've got something. We can see something. And history will show the next year we went and did the series with him and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a five-round series and uh, he won every round. Uh, he was so dominant. Um, we won it in Sydney and... Never seen a kid just so dedicated and so, but but just so vibrant and had so much fun with what he was doing. And James had come along for the ride. And I mean, Jack was just a little, I think he was a nine-year-old kid then, you know, like eight or nine-year-old kid. And Mr. And Mick and his wife are just beautiful people. And um, yeah, if you had told me that, we, that that little signing there was going to win us five out of five rounds and... And when it's an Australian title, I, I, I pinch myself s- still to this day. So that that bike behind me is a replica, uh, replica of uh, of Chris's achievement, and we'll keep that for us for the you know the remainder of our life. It was a, it was a pretty special time, Dave. How crazy too, because I, I had a lot to do with, um, I still do with North Brisbane Speedway down down Brizzy here in Queensland and Chris has come over a few times when I've been there and I wasn't even commentating or anything then I was just some dude in the crowd and he's trying to get ready for races muck around with tear offs and all this sort of stuff and here I am hanging over the fence just waffling nonsense to him and it didn't phase him at all he talked to me forever people are pulling him by the shirt say come on mate you gotta go to race and he'd go out and tell everyone up you know yeah, absolutely. That, I remember that when we were up at Appen's, we were at his house for a couple of days and I had Dean Porter who was riding for us at the time and Matt and a few of the guys that were in the motocross crew. And the, the night before we did the, the, you know, the final, he was jumping off the house roof into the swimming pool. You know, that was the sort of guy he was. He just didn't care. He was, he was all about the fun. And, 
And that's what that's what drew you to him, you know. He's just a fun guy and um, you know, when he puts his helmet on, he's all racer. And that's that's what I loved about him, you know. Like I'm I'm sure he's still like that to this day. And then obviously to go on and see him win a world championship was uh yeah, like everyone has their part to play. And um I remember he sent me a message, you know, around that time saying, you know, you, you all have a hand to play in what, what, what happened. And, you know, it's nice to be a small part of that, a very small part of that, because Chris is a, a huge talent. Yeah, how special. And you, you never know, eh? Like, you can't predict the future, but you can't tell me that that didn't start sort of building the confidence for him and then you know and look where he got to and then look at jack now jack's amazing at the moment oh, absolutely amazing it's funny you know you, you see um i <laughs> i remember jack being around the truck and having a having a bit of fun and he, he was a, he's, a, he's a really well behaved uh kid he probably won't say that now but uh he was he was really good around us and um i just remember at the time thinking you know like these kids have got the world's their oyster, and it, uh, it's built built on good family, you know. And uh, I'm very lucky; I had the same um, the same upbringing. I've got a very good, stable mum and dad, and uh, give me all the support and love. Like we never had, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars for sure. But uh, but mum and dad always made sure I I had the best, you know, the best that they could give me, so that I could go and do my best on a Friday night at Claremont, and that's what what obviously Mick did with his Enough kids. Let's talk about everyone else because I want to talk to you. Like yeah. I said, I, I was, I still am a Speedway nerd. I'm coming up 40 and I still haven't lost the passion for it. But you have made the transition from bikes into cars. Now, uh, fun fact, I did seven seasons in sprint cars in Brisbane. I was painting helmets and stuff, but I got to see a lot of racing and, Initially, I did have the bad opinion of car races. I thought, oh, you know, they're girl skirts because they got a cage. But it's pretty violent when it goes wrong, man. Yeah. Yeah, it is, mate. Yeah, I, I think if you YouTube my name, you'll see how bad it can go. But um, yeah, we uh, <laughs> yeah, I um, come from a bike background where uh, there's a lot of hard work put in physically with bikes. Um, particularly myself, where I come from a motocross background, so there's a lot of training, lots of riding, and then you go to bike speedway, and um, it does it gets a little easier on the training side of things, but then the technique is completely different too. So um, when I transitioned from uh, car. I, I retired when I was 32. Um, I just I just decided to to call it a day. I had my last year at Sheffield, and uh, you know I had a, actually had a bad break in my leg uh, last minute of the year, which wasn't ideal. But um, yeah, when I when I transitioned, I thought, oh, well, there, was, there was two things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a road racer, go to go to Bitumen, or um, I wanted to race a sprint car. Predominant, that was the only two things I wanted to do. I had a, had a ride and a road racing bike, and uh, my brother in law was actually the three time state champion here in WA at the time. I rode the bike, I loved it, it was great fun. But I had a moment at one I had a moment and nearly tipped it off. And I went, I thought, oh, do I really want to go through a heap of broken bones again? No, I don't. So uh, I went and bought a sprint car and I uh, started off in 360s and uh, had, a, had did it for a couple of years. I loved it, had a, had a couple of wins. and you know, we were fairly competitive, but I just didn't have the budget to 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 spend. As you know, with sprint car racing, if you're going to do it, you, you got to spend a lot. So, um, yeah, I had a bit of a change in life, and um, I bought a wingless sprint, and um, absolutely loved it. Great class, really competitive in Perth. It was um, we had yeah, to be 25, 30 cars every night, so uh, it was very competitive. It was relatively cheap to get in i wanted to race and and that was a good good entry 
for me to do it. So um, I raced it for uh, about two or three seasons, uh, probably about two and a half, and then I got a I got offered by Wayne Cover, who's a car owner over here, to race his uh, his Esslinger Spike, and um, that's what landed me in speed car racing. And um, I'm forever grateful to Wayne for that because uh, I absolutely I absolutely love midget racing. It's it's probably the only thing you can when you leave racing um, bikes. Speed car is a really short wheelbase race car, and you feel everything through your butt. And it's everything's tight, so uh, you literally—it's like jumping on a, a speedway bike, but the four-wheel version. So um, I jumped into that, and um, and I did did okay straight away. Uh, I think the the uh, the first night we finished third or fourth in the main, and and uh, I think we went to Collie a couple of weeks later, and we started off the front row there, which was really good. And and um, I, I found I really found my passion. For racing outside of bikes after that um and i mean like history will show i've i've raced a few divisions uh because i just love racing and i i love all the speedway I'm a, I'm a fan as well but um i uh i've raced uh 410 open with uh the wormel team um race that for a couple of years i absolutely love that too it was a great opportunity while i was still racing midgets um but the midget is where that's where my heart is um I've been very lucky. I finished uh, second in the Pro Series um, in the in the debut year of it. That was a really good thing for us. Um, that put us, you know, I suppose pretty high up at nas- nationally. Um, the following year, I got the invite to go and race in New Zealand. Um, and there's not too many guys who can say that they've, they've done that. Um, I've raced the Chili Bowl. I'm the only West Australian to race the Chili Bowl. Um, and uh, I've had a couple of seconds and stuff in, in the state titles and midgets here. I've won, won quite a few uh, midget races now, and um, I still love it. Like, it's, it, I burn for it. We, we, we're going to get going again in four weeks, and I absolutely can't wait to race it again. Midgets to me personally, when I was in in the sprint car world, obviously they're the main focus of the track at the time is the sprint cars. And I started paying attention to midgets when a friend of mine's husband was racing them. I couldn't get over how violent and cranky they are, but how much goes into actually driving them because you've got no aero. Um, Like you said, they're very short, but um, crazy horsepower for an aspirated four-cylinder as well. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. They're um, you know, they, they sort of vary between about three hundred and sixty to three hundred and eighty horsepower, depending on what sort of motor you've got. I will, I will say they've got. They, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate. I have a, a really good tie up with uh, Mark Cooper um, from American Racer, who's the owner of Spike. Um, so uh, we have a we have a very very good car. Um, we got an, we bought uh, purchased a, a Stanton SR11 last year. Um, but when I first got into midget racing, at you know the car price was about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars for a decent car. Well, you know, a new car is just one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars now. So it's got yeah, it's got a little bit expensive, that's for sure. Um, it's a bit top end heavy, which which um, I don't know if I agree if that's a good thing because obviously come from a bike background where. You know we're all pretty on par, so um, that that's that's probably a little bit of a you know question for another time. But um, yeah, we're we're fortunate enough to have a decent car now. Um, it's like everything, uh, budget drives motor racing. It, it really does. Um, where I, I'm in a, a position now where um, you know we have a decent car, we have a decent budget, I uh, have good sponsors, um, I have uh, a good team behind me. Uh, that, that have been with me for a while. Um, I still have this, you know, literally the same support I've had for the last five or six years. So uh, that, that makes us very steady. Yeah. Uh, getting, I, I say this regards to any motorsport. I find that chopping and changing all the time. I did see that in cars and I have seen it in bikes where people go, Oh, that mechanic has won this title. So I need him next year. And, you know, I think that passion 
and sort of overcomes talent sometimes where you work so hard to get there that everyone builds rather than try and get, you know, Joe Smith who just won the GP as a um, mechanic. You know what I mean? I think, um, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't have a good team, yeah, well, I, think, I think we've all been through that scenario. So I have a very good team. Um, my, uh, the guy that helped, the guys that helped me out have been around speed cars for a long time. Ian Watts, he's a former racer himself. And uh, Peter Haynes helps, uh, he's one of my sponsors as well as he helps out um, on the midget. And he was he was crewing for Ian Watts back in the 80s and 90s. So um, uh, J, JK, he's, seriously, he's 80 and he's still helping us now. And uh, my dad's obviously was a midget racer himself and dad's 75 now. But, you know, with that comes a lot of experience. So we joke, I think the combined age of our crew is about 280. But um, you say, <laughs> saying that, you know, it's nice to have that experience on board too. So. Yeah, the thing I will say is that um, it doesn't matter – uh, how long you've been doing it, um, the drive and passion has to be there and um, mine's very much still there. Uh, I'm 51 now and if you had to told me when I was 30 would I still be racing when I'm 51 and still have the hunger that I do, I would have said no way, no way at all. So um, I'm glad I do. <laughs> Recently, you just had to have a bit of a knee tidy up. What was the deal there? Oh, Jesus, where we start with injuries. Um, yeah, so I had a um, – <laughs> I used to joke, the only thing I haven't hurt is my right leg, and I've heard that now, so there you go. Um, yeah, so uh, I, ha- I had a, a bit of a tear in my um, meniscus in my right knee on the inside, a four-and-a-half-centimetre tear, and I, I believe it was from doing a, a motocross event uh, which was actually a, a fun day thing that we did up at Chidlow, which is my local home club up here that I raced as a junior. They had their 50th anniversary, so they had a uh, – they call it the Old Stars. <laughs> so I went up and had a ride. And I probably should have rode my enduro bike, mate, because the suspension was a bit soft, and uh, I think I tore my knee that day. Um, but I had that operation last week, and um, I'm already walking around. I'm pretty good. But we decided to get it done straight away because it's still four weeks away from opening night. And um, my surgeon, who I know really well, uh, he, <laughs> he said, uh, he said, let's get it done now. He goes, opening night, you might be a little sore, but you've you still got full range of movement. So that was, it was a pretty easy decision. Yeah. So I've, I've not been really, I, I didn't, I never crashed a lot when I was, when I was a bike rider, but normally when I did, I, I did a good job. Okay. Now, superstition is a big thing for um, competitive people. What are some of your superstitions when it comes to racing or have they sort of gone away now? Uh, May I, to be honest, I, I never really had any superstitions apart from when I was bikes, I would pull my goggles on with my right hand. Never always did the same thing. I would pull them over like that and never with the left. And when I get in the car, the last, the last thing I always do is um, I clap my hands and grab the wheel. Like and subscribe, please. In my time in cars, there was some dudes and it was some of the younger guys were like this in 410s where they'd be talking like this as they'd be fully bolted in they'd be literally being pushed out and they're like, oh, what are we doing tomorrow? And then some of the older guys, they'd be dead focused. You couldn't get a word out of them. So it's just funny seeing the difference. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm definitely a guy that can – I can talk pretty much right up to we're going out if we're sitting in the chute. But once we're in the chute, I'm pretty quiet. Yeah, I think, I think that's your time. Yes, yeah, your go time. As soon as – we get to the track. I'm I'm probably a bit social, to be honest. Like I go around and say good day to everybody, and that's the way I calm my own nerves. I still do to this day, and uh, but now, yeah, like I, I suppose uh, because you can get bit pretty hard in a speed car, and um, and I have been hurt 
and a midget. So, yeah, yeah, your concentration level needs to be right up there, that's for sure. The thing people don't understand too is with any form of motorsport, things happen fast, but in um, we'll, we'll harp on about the midget thing. Things happen really, really fast, and people say, oh, you've got so much room and all that, but when there's really one line and you're trying to keep sticking to that line, if it goes wrong, it happens like that. It happens really fast. Um, you know, like I, I had a, uh, a crash, I guess I six years ago now. It was actually about 11 days after my son was born. And um, we just come back from New Zealand. I was in pretty good form and was pushing pretty hard to, to pass one of the young kids here, Caden Manders, who is really fast. And I just went into the corner too hot. Um, but, but like, literally, we're talking an inch. And... I'd completely destroyed a car. Like, and I got hurt. I got broke both my kneecaps and massive concussion. I rip, rip, a, rip my stomach lining and stuff. And, and that's how quick it can happen. But it, if you had have told me when I was going to the corner, was I doing much wrong? No, not really. Um, but it was, I'm literally talking, it was an inch. Uh, have I done that be- before? You know, a thousand times? Yes, I have and got away with it. So, um, yeah, you're right. It just comes up really quick. Now, before we end this, I've got to talk about him, but Dave Parker has been someone who I pretty much idolised because I used to have Gilman posters on my toolbox at work and all this. Now I'm fortunate enough that Gilman actually are sponsoring me to go to events and stuff, but DP has been amazing in the background to try and rustle up some of the people from sort of my era of riding. But uh, who's Dave Parker to you, mate? Mate, Dave Parker's uh, been a... Good friend of mine for him and Claire, actually, a good friend of mine for probably 25, 30 years. Um, very fortunate enough to meet him when I was riding uh, back at Claremont. Uh, met him through, obviously, when he was running Fraser Imports and bought a lot of stuff off of him. Dave's, we call him Honest Dave because he's very honest. He would tell me when I was completely shit and uh, he still does to this day. Uh, I love him. Absolutely love him immensely for his honesty. Uh, I'm very fortunate enough to say he's a very close friend of mine and uh, he's done so much for Bike Speedway. Uh, guys like him and David Tapps from my era, uh, you, can, you can't put, you can't put um, a price on that, um, that he's just a good human being who... Not, not everyone necessarily agrees with you know every, everything that Dave does, but he's first and foremost, his passion was always speedway motorcycle racing. That's what I love about him. It still is to this day. You know, we're we're doing a uh, a land speed challenge thing uh, this year um, coming up at uh, at the lake, and um, you know when he asked me to be involved with it, yeah, hundred percent. Like I couldn't give him money quick enough because. Um, it's just, he doesn't do anything by halves. And uh, if you've seen, I, and I was lucky enough to see Gilman when it very first started to what it is today. Him and, and his team done an amazing job there. Absolutely. It's probably one of the best speedways in the world, let alone Australia. Well, if you're- Thirty-seven-year-old man-child here. When I went there at Easter time, I literally cried when I walked through the gates, and I got yeah. caught. Uh, people caught me doing it, and I said there was dust around. It was dead flat weather. There was no dust. I got caught red-handed. Yeah, absolutely, mate. It's, a, it's an amazing job. I, I've obviously been there quite a bit. Went back in the day when I was going there to do some training schools and stuff, and. Um, Hey, no one's surprised. No one's more surprised than me when he rang me to ask me to come and do that. But just because we'd come from a from Clamo, which is such a heavy clay track, it made sense what he was was talking about. And, and we and we did some schools there and stuff. And I loved riding there; it's a great track. So, um, but just to see how the pits are and the you know just how easy it is to access the place. And you know, I, I, I'm good friends, obviously, with with Lee and Kylie Adams, and and you. You would go. We would all meet there. It was it was a it was a good place to meet up and race. Let alone you know like just catch up with your friends. Like it's just a, a fantastic venue. It gets really long the more you race and that. But who are some of the people you'd like to thank that kind of don't get 
thanks and they sort of hang around in the background? Oh, mate, yeah, Dave Parker would be one of those, definitely. Uh, David Tapp, uh, that all been very significant, uh, had very significant roles in my racing career. A guy called Rod Calhoun, Rocket. Definitely uh, my parents, uh, Chuck and Kerry, uh, my sister. Uh, they all uh, obviously play a massive part in what you do uh, in my later life and until now. My, my wife, Lisa, and, and my son, Lucas. And um, I'm, I'm very fortunate, mate, with my car racing. I've got such a great bunch of people that, that help us out. Um, Ian Watts, JK, Hainsey, um, uh, Mark Cooper from American Tire Racer Services and um, even guys like Mark. I'm I'm lucky to say like Mark Brown and Nathan Smee and those guys, they, they all influence you, mate, in some way. And uh, I'm very lucky to say they're good friends and uh, guys like Travis Mills and um yeah yeah I, i'm pretty i'm pretty grateful mate it's been a good journey for myself and you know it's it's not over yet but um to say i've had a really good bike career and and then gone on to ha- have a, a pretty great car career is is fantastic and um even my father-in-law mark he was my crew chief for five or six years and stan morris the guys that so sort of, they're not around now but you know they still pick up the phone and Hey mate, had you went all right on the weekend, and um, I had a couple of calls. We we broke the track record on the last night we we raced, and and that was pretty cool, you know, like because the kids I'm racing against are 25, and they, and they've been racing all year where I hadn't been racing all year because we we had a we had a massive engine blow, and I got hurt um, just after Christmas, so I'd have like sort of 12 weeks out. So um, yeah, all those people, um, Gavin Migra runs the Perth Motorplex. You know, like they're just, they're all people you meet along the way and you, and you love them. I said it at my 50th year at home last year. If you can measure your wealth um, by your friendship, I'm a millionaire 20 times over. Well, it sounds like you've managed to carry on the bike sort of career into the cars, but I can't thank you enough for coming on to the pole line, mate. And you're one of many from your era that are about to play a huge role in my career. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Probably a couple of guys just think to is uh, Dave Cheshire and Steve Johnson. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, and I'm sure in, in the future have guys like that on because they're very funny characters. <laughs> uh-huh. Please.